um, let me share my screen for you for a second. Um, welcome to our um, September meeting of the Alliance for Disease Prevention and Response. We are really fortunate today that we will have the opportunity to talk some about building public trust um, with some of our national leaders, all of you all, but also Dr. Tom Frieden. Um, unfortunately, Georges Benjamin was not able to join us today, so he said hello, but um, we are very fortunate to have Kay Bender, the president-elect of APHA, who has agreed to step in and help to facilitate the conversation. Um, so just really quickly, the issues, is this advancing? There we go, sorry. Um, really quickly, we're gonna talk about challenges around building trust to help us end the pandemic, um, to help to reach new and hesitant partners, um, and also to encourage public health precautions and vaccination. Um, but then we're gonna hopefully take a chance to look a little bit more long-term to think about how to create trust that we all need to help develop the long-term resilient and equitable public health system that we need. Um, and then after we have kind of this initial fireside chat, um, together we'll think about what opportunities might there be for collaboration and how we can take action to help to facilitate that trust. We have a really great fireside chat today. Um, I am fortunate to get to introduce first um, Kay Bender, who, as I mentioned, is the president-elect of APHA. Um, she's the executive director of the Mississippi Public Health Association, um, the former director of the Public Health Accreditation Board, um, has been a state and local health official, uh, has been a nurse, and so has amazing experience that she can bring to our discussion today. So with that, I will turn it over to Kay. Thank you, Angie, and I am so pleased to welcome you all but, and to welcome our Fireside Chat expert, Dr. Tom Frieden. Um, Dr. Frieden, you may know, is a physician who's trained in internal medicine, infectious disease, public health, and epidemiology. Wow, what a combination. Uh, most of us in public health know him as the former director of of the CDC and former commissioner of the New York Health Department. Um, he's currently the president and CEO of Resolve to Save Lives, uh, which is an initiative of the Global Health Organization Vital Strategies. Dr. Frieden, I, I'm going to continue with your bio, but I just have to say that what I, during the first parts of COVID, when I saw your face, and you heard your voice on television and on the radio um, and on Facebook and all those places, there was a certain amount of poor cyber relief um, because uh, a lot of us know uh, just how much experience you have with outbreaks and, and pandemics and epidemics uh, and all of that. And for those of you who don't know that, um, Dr. Frieden started his public health career in New York City, um, identifying and then leading an effort that stopped the largest outbreak of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis to occur in the U.S. Um, and if that weren't enough, he was then um, assigned on loan from the CDC to India, where he held scale a program for effective TB. Uh, diagnosis, treatment, and uh, monitoring. And then when Mayor Mike Bloomberg became um, mayor of New York City, he asked Dr. Frieden to be the health commissioner. And I guess that's sort of when I first got to know about Dr. Frieden because of his efforts to reduce smoking and other leading causes of death. Um, that increased life expectancy uh, by three years. Um, when he went to CDC, he oversaw the work that helped to uh, develop, the, uh, to help end, actually, the 2014 West Africa Ebola epidemic. And, of course, as I said, he now leads Resolve to Save Lives, which he'll tell us about a little bit more. But um, that is an initiative of Vital Strategies of Global Health Organizations, organization that partners with countries to pre prevent 100 million deaths and to make the world safer from epidemics. And as I said, Dr. Frieden has, during the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, overseen an expansion of the Resolve to Save Lives activity, including uh, policy and program innovations in the U.S. 
counsel and support to multilateral institutions, support for rapid response, healthcare worker safety, and data-driven decision-making um, in more than 20 countries. Wow. Uh, Dr. Friedman is also a senior fellow for global health at the Council of Foreign Relations. I don't think we could have a better uh, person to help us uh, think about this conversation. Uh, so welcome, Dr. Friedman. This is a great group. We have wonderful conversations, and as Angie said, today we want to start by talking about this dilemma that we have about public trust. Trust in the vaccine, trust in the information. Um, and so I would like to start by just asking you, how do we build trust in the vaccines and so that those who are unvaccinated see the dangers of COVID and the dangers of not being vaccinated? And how do we work across sectors? We've got lots of sectors in this alliance. Um, to be a part of the building of that trust. Well, thanks very much for the invitation. It's great to share a few minutes with you all and uh, great to see uh, old friends, longtime friends uh, in this group. I, I think, as we all know, there is no magic answer to building trust. In an emergency, the one thing that you cannot surge is trust and trust once broken is very difficult to regain and takes a long time to gain. So I, I think the, the bad news here is this is not easy. Uh, and uh, if you look at both masks and vaccines, these are our two most powerful tools against COVID. And they themselves have been infected with toxic partisanship. And um, I think one thing when it comes to building trust, you have to start with listening and respecting. And I, I'll you know, speak to the public health community for a minute. I think we all get that when we're dealing with communities that have been historically marginalized, that haven't had access to healthcare, that may have experienced racism um, or other systemic problems, we understand that there's a lack of trust, there's a need to build that trust, there's a need to listen to what the concerns are, to identify people within the community who can be the right messengers, to try out different messages and uh, make those messages work. And that same set of skills, commitments, principles, expertise, uh, is relevant for every single community that we deal with, including uh, rural individuals who may be very suspicious of the government, including people in a wide variety of settings. Um, as some of you uh, may have seen, Frank Luntz and the Devoma Foundation held a, have held a series of focus groups, and I've been privileged to be part of several of those, uh, with uh, Trump voters who are not viciously anti-vaccine, but who are not planning to get vaccinated, but are not completely close to it. And I have to say it was really eye-opening. Um, the, the group there felt, if you had to kind of summarize it, they felt disrespected. They felt that they had valid questions that hadn't been answered, uh, that you know the perspective was, if I'm asking a question, people are gonna tell me I'm an idiot. Uh, there's a deep sense of alienation I remember one woman in one of the focus groups said, don't tell me that we're all in this together. We're not. You're sending your kids to private schools. And um, this was addressed to the entire group of experts out there. And, and they were Republican and Democratic elected officials on the call. And, and this group of, of Trump voters said, we don't want to hear from anyone in politics. We want to hear from our doctor. We want to hear from our nurse, from our pharmacist. We want to hear from people locally. And we wanna understand the, the real stories of people who are dealing with COVID. And I think that's something that we need to continue to do better, to, to tell the stories uh, of COVID, not just the stories of loss of life, but of long COVID. One of the things that we're doing now at Resolve, um, we, did a folk, we did a series of uh, studies to document that 
for many young, healthy people, learning more about long COVID would be highly motivating in terms of getting vaccinated. And so we're currently developing some materials along those lines. Um, and I think in terms of a multi-sectoral group, uh, different groups can do different things in terms of promoting awareness and support. Um, one thing that we found very powerful is for uh, business to play a role in uh, advocating for sensible policies. Uh, often in public health, we go to business and say, hey, can you, you know, your business, you, that must mean you have a lot of money. Can you give us money for something? That's actually not the best role of most industries. Uh, they have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders if they're publicly owned companies, to their employees in any case. Um, and uh, we really need to approach uh, the business community by saying, all right, let's identify the common ground. Uh, we want a level playing field. We want uh, predictability. We want um, non-disruption of essential services. And that's all uh, common ground. And if a business leader goes into, whether it's a mayor or a governor or a senator or a congressman or a president or a secretary uh, of, a, of an agency, um, you know, me going in or Dr. Walensky or any public health leader versus a CEO of a company, let me tell you, there's no comparison in terms of the kind of credibility that that message is going to have. So again, it gets back to the right messengers and the right messages. So I'll stop there. That's good. You know, uh, yesterday I was talking to a friend of mine who's a physician and she said, uh, in a rural area, and she said she's seen more and more people um, come in and ask for the vaccine, um, but ask her to assure that she won't tell anybody they got it. Um, <laughs> so this is kind of an interesting rural thing. So let's talk about the mask. Um, of course, the mask mandates have been uh, the center of much of the discussions about COVID and, you know, of course, there's still controversy related to that. And yet we know there's still useful, it's still a useful strategy, uh, even for the vaccinated. Uh, but we've seen, um, we've just seen a real partisan kind of divide around the country. Um, thoughts about how we manage all this controversy around the mask mandate? You know, um, I, I think uh, part of the challenge is that the vaccines are so effective that people think, well, great, you know, I'm vaccinated, nothing more is needed. And frankly, it was a misstep of CDC uh, to say that you don't need to mask if you're vaccinated. And many of us said that at the time. And that, that really is a step backwards. And I think CDC is still digging out from under that mistake. Um, Delta is highly infectious. And the way to think of it is the virus has upped its game. We need to up our game also. And that means having multiple layers of protection. I, I think it's so unfortunate that masks have been politicized because fundamentally uh, getting people to mask indoors is a lot less disruptive than closing things. So if we want to keep things open, then vaccinate and mask. Um, I think also uh, we need to be very frank about the communication about masks. With the highly infectious Delta strains and with masking being very inconsistent, people who are concerned or who are more vulnerable, whether because of age or underlying condition, probably want to up their mask game, uh, upgrading to an N95 or KN95 mask. And, and I think we need to be frank about that. But people are all over the map with masks, with um, combination of uh, uh, people who uh, just hate them and want to take them off the second they can and people who are concerned and maybe even wearing them where there isn't uh, much need for masking. One other area that I think is important is understanding the level of spread. Um, it's going to be like a dial. Uh, at times, there's going to be a lot of COVID and it's going to be dangerous out there. At times, there's not going to be much COVID and it's not going to be dangerous out there. 
Everyone should get vaccinated no matter what when they're eligible. In terms of masking, outdoor masking really in most settings, not, not that important. Some outdoor settings where you have tons of people together with little ventilation, screaming in small spaces, you know, I, I worry that that's certainly uh, an environment where there'll be some spread, but most outdoor spaces, are not much of a risk. Indoor spaces where there's a lot of spread, we don't have a way of verifying uh, vaccine status, it makes a lot of sense to mask. And yet you see enormous uh, variability around the US. I never thought I would say um, mask be, be such a controversial issue, uh, but I'm in a state right now where it's very controversial. So as, as, as I shared with uh, people uh, with your bio, the work of Resolve to Save Lives is, is global in nature. Um, how do you think the role of the United States has played in this pandemic and our efforts to assist others across the world. Um, is there, have we done a good job? Is there more we could do? Um, sort of talk to us about that. Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, the US has been a negative example going back for the past 18 months. Um, in the past, the US has been able to positively influence global health through support that we've provided, through staff that we've sent, and also by getting it right here or in our own actions. Uh, and we've kind of been a, a counterexample over the past 18 months with uh, repeatedly not getting it right uh, and then not really having the data. We have to look to Singapore, uh, United Kingdom, uh, other countries that really have much better handle on their COVID data. So uh, the US has really lost its leadership position here. And I'm deeply distressed by the failure to scale up manufacturing. We have lots of good vaccines, but there's a lot to suggest that the mRNA vaccines are special. First off, they're easier to tweak for variants. Second, they're a chemical rather than biological production process. So it's a much more reliable production process. Third, they're quicker to scale up, months rather than years. So since February, we've been uh, advocating for the US government to use uh, the power of uh, persuasion to get Moderna in particular to transfer technology to vaccine production hubs that can make billions of doses. And there's a myth out there that we're going to face a glut of vaccines in 2022. That's nonsense. Uh, you have to look at the most effective vaccines, at the possibility that we'll need a three dose series for people, at the possibility that people who got other vaccines will need a booster dose or an additional dose with an mRNA vaccine. We are billions of doses short. And what we've heard, um, and this is one area where I have to be critical of the current administration. What we've heard is a deafening silence followed by a call for more meetings. We don't need more meetings, we need more vaccines. And the US government has the wherewithal to make this happen. I've seen no evidence that they've done anything to make it happen. So I have to say it's, it's been a, a disappointment both in the past administration and in the current one. Yeah. And you know, I, I mean, that may be unduly harsh, if you talk to folks within the administration, they say we've provided more vaccines globally than any other country. And that's true. Uh, and certainly there's a lot of good work that's being done in partnership by CDC and other parts of the government to provide staff and expertise and support. Uh, but really the US is not playing the role that it could play, needs to play. And if it did play, it would be great for us epidemiologically because we could tamp down spread elsewhere as well as uh, signaling that the U.S. is back in terms of being a good partner for countries around the world. So let's let's uh, piece that out a little bit more. As you know, there this has been a season of a lack of public trust in government. You alluded to that earlier, um, and I'm seeing, uh, you know, colleagues that are part of this alliance who represent 
uh, state and local health departments where we've lost a lot of our health officials um, because of their doing their job, really, uh, with the pandemic. Um, and I know when you were at the CDC, you, you were very clear about the need for a strong governmental public health system that the public trusted. So what measures do you think people, those of us who support governmental public health can take to restore trust in CDC as well as the state and local public health agencies around the country? Well, uh, I think there's a, a short-term issue and a, a larger strategic issue. The short-term issue is, you know, the, the principles of emergency health communication are the same. Be first, be right, be credible, be empathetic, give people practical, proven, concrete things to do to protect themselves, their family, and their community. That's not changed. And we need to continue to do that. We need to do that better. Uh, I think in the longer term, we need a renaissance, a public health renaissance in this country. And uh, the challenges that we face are public health being too slow, too impractical, and not strategic enough. And there are a few reasons for that that are structural, despite great work being done by lots of people. Um, one thing that we, I hope, will do is change the way we fund our health defense. And we've suggested a health defense operations budget designation that would be discretionary budget cap exempt. It would give Congress the authority to decide which lines they're going to support and how much each year, but they wouldn't have to have this terrible dilemma of do we protect against a possible future emergency or fund and take your pick, Alzheimer's research, early head start, lots of really valuable programs. We're never going to win that fight, never. Uh, the only way out of this that's sustainable is a budget cap exemption for the discretionary budget. We think that should be tied with a, uh, a professional judgment process that bypasses OMB. So Congress can get an unvarnished view of what that requires. And with that kind of resources, and even with the existing resources that CDC already has, I would hope that it would embed thousands and thousands of staff in state, city, and local public health departments for two to five years at a time, and have many of those staff then rotate back to CDC Atlanta. Because frankly, we don't have common vision in this country. Um, too often, folks at CDC recommend stuff, and state, city, local public health folks roll their eyes and say that's not practical. Too often, uh, state, city, local folks are implementing without the benefit of best practices and systems that work robustly across the country. And part of that can be addressed by that kind of a revolving staff. You, you've seen it in uh, programs like EIS and uh, PHAP, but they're small compared with the need. They're a tiny fraction of the need, and you could build on that in a variety of areas, ranging from informatics to implementation to risk communication to community engagement. There's also a need uh, in the CDC budget for cross-cutting lines. One of the reasons it's hard for CDC to be strategic is that the folks at CDC are in their specific area. And other than the office of the director, there's really not much that in the agency that looks overall so unless you have that kind of cross-cutting line, you're not likely to have that strategic approach. But fundamentally, we need to communicate better. We need to address the speed, the quality, the practicality, and how strategic our actions are. Have you been surprised about the increased politicization of public health during the pandemic, or is, has it increased? It I've feels been, like there's more political interference yeah, at every I, level. Well, I think I've been disappointed by it, I have to say. Um, Senator Moynihan used to say, you're entitled to your own opinion, but not to your own facts. And now people seem to be feel a sense of entitlement to their own facts. And we need to get back to that focus on at least, let's we can disagree about important things, 
but we shouldn't be disagreeing about the facts. Um, the, um, I, I think um, on the one hand, during the prior administration, really a, um, a barrier was breached that had never been breached before, a degree of interference with technical matters that is un really unprecedented. I, I mean, no one ever read the MMWRs uh, above CDC for a clearance reason during my eight years as director. And to have them not only reading them, but editing them is, is mind boggling. And having people at HHS put stuff on the CDC website that isn't written by CDC, it's, it's basically graffiti on the CDC website, except uh, people don't know it's graffiti. So it's you know much more invidious than that. Um, but I, I think on the other hand, um, public health decisions, as you all know, are inherently political decisions. And it's not inappropriate to have a political discussion of policy matters. Uh, what is inappropriate is for that policy discussion to either quash the facts or to uh, claim to be speaking for an agency that's not, that's, that is not speaking with that voice. So I don't know if you can see the chat box, but there's, uh, there's quite a bit of uh, support for this idea of public health renaissance. So uh, maybe, that's, uh, maybe that's something we, uh, we need to discuss a little, a little bit further. Um, uh, one of the questions in the chat box is also, um, can we talk a little bit more about long haul COVID? and what uh, those of us who work in public health or our partners who are in this alliance, um, is there advice or uh, that you would give us about the long haul COVID? Well, first in terms of we need to know more about risk factors, rates, treatment. And I do think that NIH should be the lead for that. Uh, and they've got a lot of resources we should be working with them, engaging with them, and seeing what can be done. I also think that um, increasing awareness of long-haul COVID will help with uh, vaccine hesitancy. And uh, Stephanie Mayfield, I know, is uh, on the call. Uh, Aaron Sykes is the head of communications for us at Resolve. And um, if, if there are any places that uh, we'd be happy to uh, work with, any places uh, to advance uh, getting that message out and disseminating it more widely. So I have a thousand other questions I'd love to ask you about, but I don't uh, want to be selfish. So uh, let's turn to our uh, audience here and see what um, their questions are. One of the questions in the chat box, how important do you feel it is to have voices of frontline health and mental health practitioners at the table as we plan policy and evaluation. Yeah, I think there is a disconnect uh, between clinical medicine and public health, and we do need to bridge that. If I kind of, and, and I'll have time for one more question after this one, but um, okay. if I think of the, the three main lessons for, um, uh, from the pandemic. The first is the need for a public health renaissance. The second is the need for a primary health care system that's much more uh, central to our health care system because primary health care is uh, crucial for detection, for treatment, for vaccination. And the third is the need for more resilient individuals and communities. And that increased resilience will come from public and public health policies, ranging from some of the very effective anti-poverty measures that have been implemented over the past year, uh, to tobacco control, to hypertension prevention and treatment, uh, to injury and uh, drug use uh, prevention and management programs. Uh, this is really important. Uh, all three of these things are needed. And Optimistically, I would hope that uh, now that it's so clear how important public health is and health is, we might, despite all of the controversy, despite the negativism, we might have really the opportunity to hit the reset button and have a much 
healthier approach to improving health in the United States. So that leads nicely to our last question. We've talked a lot about the challenges that we're facing in public health. Um, what gives you hope? You always have that smile on your face and every time I see you uh, talk about public health, you, you seem hopeful. Um, what gives you hope for the future of public health? Well, I, I think um, on the one hand, there has never been a moment as teachable as the current moment. More than 10 million deaths globally. By the end of this month, more Americans will have been killed by COVID than were killed in the 1918 flu pandemic. The economic cost is well in excess of $10 trillion. And uh, two years ago, uh, in our work in global health, when I said we needed five or $10 billion a year for a decade, people looked at me like I was crazy. You know, that's way too much money. Now I say the same thing. People still look like, at me like I'm crazy. It couldn't possibly be that inexpensive. Uh, and so I do think there's a recognition of the importance of public health and of the potential of public health. Um, so success is far from assured, but um, we've seen that good public health action really is something that makes a difference between life and death, between costing trillions of dollars and saving trillions of dollars. So I, I remain hopeful that we'll do the right thing as a society and a world and invest in public health. Yeah, well, thank you, Dr. Frieden. Um, uh, thank you so much for the time you've given us today. I know we haven't gotten to everybody's questions, but um, uh, we're so grateful for the time you were able to give us. And uh, I wanna keep seeing you out there and championing uh, the reasonableness that needs to occur. So thank you very much. Thank you all very much. And it's nice to be uh, in conversation with you and all the best. And thank you for the work that you all do. Thank you, Dr. Frieden. Have a good rest of the week. All right. So um, I, we could have gone on with that forever, but that was the time that, um, <laughs> that he was able to give us. Um, you do have some great questions in the chat box and you, maybe we can get to those as we um, talk amongst ourselves and share information. Uh, but, but with that, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks so much. So I think we were really fortunate to have a great discussion. I think you all have started to tee up hopefully what uh, will be our discussion going forward. Um, but I know a lot of things came up. So I just wanted to say, is there anything that people just really, before we move into a broader discussion, have this directly related to what um, Tom Frieden was just telling us about you just either want to put out in the chat feature or want to want to get off your chest quickly, and then we'll, we'll move into a broader discussion. I have just one quick thing, Andy. First of all, thank you again for organizing this. It's a really terrific um, conversation to get Dr. Frieden's insights. One of the, the tensions I'm hearing is, you know, all of the things we talked about in terms of communicating well and, and perhaps differently in, in a more... Um, sensitive and nuanced way. At the same time, you know, Kay, I heard talking about the um, sense of overwhelm and exhaustion and um, I don't know if you can say fear, but I mean, the, the threat being threatened, certainly, um, that many health, uh, public health officials are. And that's not a place where you're going to do your best communication and best sort of creative sort of thinking and, and um, you know, communicating. So I just wonder about that tension. I don't know that it's a, a question or that there's an answer, but at the very time that we want people to be maximally communicative in the best possible way, many are in a situation where their kids are getting accosted, people are coming to their, their houses, the Idaho public health director, you know, had people following her and showing up at her house. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, a, a Lauren, that's, that's actually a great point. I think I heard Dr. Frieden um, say I was trying to take notes while I was also uh, trying to focus on moderating. But, but I think what I heard him say is, you know, um, that's when we turn to our partners. I know in our state here, um, our we have a centralized public health system and 
when our state health officer uh, started getting uh, death threats to his family and himself and that sort of thing, um, he had been all over uh, the television, Facebook, I mean, very accessible, trying to give information. But he backed off a little bit and started um, def not deferring publicly, but he called on partners, the president of the State Medical Association, the dean of the School of Medicine at our only academic health science center who happens to be an infectious uh, disease doc, so credible. Um, we have an ad running right now uh, of an African-American long-standing judge who's well-respected in our state who, who said, I didn't get vaccinated, I got COVID, thank God I didn't die, I've been vaccinated now. I mean, that's basically her message. So I, I, think, um, I think that's, at least that's, I don't know about others, but I think that's what I heard Dr. Freedom say is sometimes the government has to back off, has to know when to back off and feed that credible information to trusted partners. Um, you know, at the very beginning, he talked about listen and identify um, trusted messengers. Um, but that's just, uh, that was my, what I heard. Thanks. No, I heard that also, Kay. And I think for all of us, the more we can give kind of those on the ground cover and think about how we can get messages out ourselves, I think the better. Because I think this really is a, I mean, I haven't seen that many pandemics, but this has really shocked me about just the real partisanship and the um, kind of fear that has come up just based on, you know, threats and things like that, that I don't think I would have expected. Um, I know Lisa Simpson has had a couple of questions or points. So Lisa, I don't know if there's one you want to kind of jump in on now. No, you guys have been um, doing a great job picking up uh, conversation there. So again, thank you for these sessions. They're fantastic. I just trying to maintain resilience of, amongst ourselves as we go into this winter and among our teams is just, uh, I can't imagine being a frontline provider right now, uh, whether a public health provider or a clinical provider. So I wish us all resilience. Uh, this is Donna and Lisa, I'm just gonna piggyback on that and just share a, a real quick snapshot of going into an urgent care because I couldn't get into my primary care doc. And there were nurses in tears walking out of the doors because there were only two physicians and it took four hours to get through an urgent care because the hospital in, in Annapolis, Maryland is overloaded, number one. At primary care docs are not able to see all the patients that they have, number two. Uh, and then number three, the overload and the flooding of everyone going into urgent care, not just for testing, not just for um, regular visits, but because they don't have any primary care docs and the emergency rooms are overloaded. So if you have people waiting four hours, four hours in from five o'clock in the evening until 10 o'clock at night with only two physicians able to treat and or to, to adhere, that's just one, an N of one. Can you imagine multiply that across our country at the height of what might be a growing disease um, state as we may or may not be experiencing coming up, but I just think we're really in for some some really interesting days ahead even. So thank you, Ernie, for your comments also about the flu campaign, the flu shots. I mean, we're, we're very concerned about the decline in clinical preventive services and the, the routine vaccines. So I think that this is really coming up on a perfect storm, but, but thank you, Lisa, for bringing that question forward. Thank you. I see Janet next, and then we will I think we've already moved in our group discussion, but we'll, <laughs> we'll officially take it. Go ahead. Thank, thanks so much, I, I, Janet Hamilton uh, with CSTE. I, I guess just building on that theme, um, one thing that that I wanted to raise and would be really interested in in hearing from others and thinking through this, and you know, I would just say that I think um, our public health members, our epidemiologists and departments, and I, I don't want to say it's just um, true for epidemiologists, but I almost feel like they're experiencing a sense of betrayal um, in a way where, right, the public, you know, is no, 
is not responding to something that we feel personally passionate about that are, um, <laughs> you know, in terms of so many of our members, you know, is they came to public health because they wanted to do such good um, and to have that impact. And I think the, the mental health status of our community is actually, I will say at an all time low, I feel like Last year, you know, there was this hope, there was the hope of the vaccine, there was this effort towards the fact that we were going to be controlling things and getting better. And now, you know, I share all the concerns that we're going into a phase of um, real despair. And I just, I'm really worried about our own members just being able to continue on. And then they're interacting, of course, with their healthcare partners, which are totally overwhelmed, um, and and also having that um, and that despair as well. So, you know, within the healthcare community, they don't feel that they can treat people. Their beds are full. They don't have the time or the space. And so, I'm just really more worried than ever about our our public health members in terms of just being able to keep going on. And it does feel like there's been a frame shift in, in where we are to even try to be able to help them. And I, I, I just am wondering what others have thought about this. And I do think, you know, there's been lots of discussion around resiliency training. I just find even with our members that it's like, I'm too busy to even participate in something like that. And you, you know, it, that word and terminology isn't necessarily resonating with people. It's almost like, don't you recognize how resilient I've already been? Um, so any, anyway, I'm, I'm just um, maybe putting that out there for people to, to really think about and, and how we not just support the healthcare workers, which are, of course, doing an incredible amount, but really try to think about supporting members within the public health community. Yeah, Janet, I think that's a, that's a good point. You know, when COVID first started, a lot of a lot of us, uh, state public health associations, ABHA, a lot of the nursing associations, uh, hospital association, were doing a lot of Zoom sessions um, with healthcare and public health workers, um, talking about you know we we're here to support you. Um, you know, practice self-care and all that kind of stuff. And what we're hearing lately uh, on the boots on the ground is, I don't need another Zoom session about how to relax. I need <laughs> two weeks off from work. You know, I need to get away from COVID. Um, it's, so I think your point is very well taken because it's gone on this long and it's been so emotionally charged and it's affected the elective surgeries and the ICU beds and and other things that that our our healthcare workers and our public health workers are just drained. And you're right, they have been resilient. And you know, just how much more uh, how much more do they have in them to be able um, to to function? Um, I see in the chat box, Angie, Sina Kim um, uh, talks about a new national physician support line staffed by psychiatrists for peer-to-peer -peer support. Um, I just wanted to, to point that out. Thank you, Sina, for that. Angie, I'll quit talking. No, totally great. Um, you've always had great points. Um, so one thing we wanted to do, and so I think one thing I hadn't pointed out, and I think I'm really hearing is that we also need to add out building trust with our own public health and our own frontline workers, which I think is something, um, what can we do to support them? So I think that's one thing, let's add that as a point. Um, but I am now fortunate that I'm gonna just um, ask us to transition a little bit to kind of the broader group discussion, and I'm gonna turn it over to Steve Greeley, who will help us with that. Um, please keep using the chat function. I think we're using it extremely well today. We'll pull out all these resources and make sure we share them with you all also. Um, but I will turn it to Steve and I'll help um, point out the issues that we think are coming up. Um, you all, please, you're doing a great job raising your hands, but first we wanted to give a little bit of the community perspective and then we'll jump back into these issues. Um, Steve, I'll hand it great. to you. 
Thank you. Yeah. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that Dr. Frieden um, referred to um, prominently uh, just now um, was the need to promote a community resilience. And we have a, a, a guest um, that would like to speak to this. Um, she's part of Resilient American Communities, which is one of our member organizations. And this is Janice Lucas, um, who works, uh, I believe, in the Panhandle region of Florida and heads a group called uh, the Lead Coalition, Bay County, Florida. And um, Janice, I would love to have you talk um, about uh, the work that you're doing uh, to engage um, residents of your community um, as full partners um, in um, the public health process and to respond to the challenges through uh, the engagement of your, your own community. You just want to come off mute, Janice. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, good afternoon and thank you for the introduction, uh, Stephen, and thank you all, um, to everyone who's involved in this uh, great conversation this afternoon. I am, a, I am executive director of the LEAD Coalition, and the LEAD Coalition is the community convener for Resilient American Communities Bay County. And we've been working uh, together with other community-based organizations uh, consistently since March of 2020 and intermittently with our local uh, public health department. Uh, that has taken you know, a, a little bit of, of maneuvering to, uh, to get together. Uh, but since this latest surge in our community, uh, we're all on the same page and working together to uh, increase vaccinations. Uh, Panama City, Florida is located in Bay County in the central Florida panhandle um, between uh, about midway, almost exactly midway between Tallahassee uh, to our east and uh, Pensacola to our west. Uh, the political climate here is uh, one that is, is very, very, very conservative. Uh, and so uh, we are having uh, some challenges uh, getting masks and, um, and other protocols that have been recommended in place. Um, in fact, yesterday I was one of the speakers at the local school board meeting. Uh, two weeks ago, they rescinded a mask uh, requirement for employees. And so now we have uh, no uh, requirements at all for our school children uh, or in the schools. It's recommended. Um, but um, you know about how well that's going. So that's one of the uh, uphill battles that we're, we're having uh, in, in our community uh, locally. Uh, since March, 2020, we've looked at um, data. Uh, we've seen the uh, numbers rise. The ebb and flow of COVID-19 as it has happened um, in our community as well as uh, around the country. Uh, some of the uh, uh, respondents, uh, responses that we've had have included creating COVID-19 kits that we uh, dropped on the doorsteps of people suffering from COVID-19. Early on in the pandemic, it was very hard to access oximeters. And uh, we have a, a very resourceful a member of our uh, community who was able to get in a large shipment of oximeters. We put them together with thermometers, a log, uh, and, and um, masks and gloves, and made them available to, to people in the community to, to drop off to people who were uh, suffering from COVID-19. We also uh, went throughout the community and dropped uh, hundreds, um, more than a thousand on two occasion of information. Uh, when we were in lockdown last year, we reasoned uh, that people were not going to have access uh, in our targeted neighborhoods. Uh, the Lead Coalition is a community development corporation serving uh, underserved and vulnerable neighborhoods uh, in three community revitalization areas in Panama City. But we also understood very quickly that uh, in order to get ahead of the pandemic to mitigate its uh, effect on our communities, we would have to work together throughout the county, not just in those small communities. Case in point, um, we're a tourist community. And so while the numbers were going up in 32401 zip code, which is in Panama City, um, there was a mandate, uh, mask mandate in the summer of 2020 placed on businesses and employees on Panama City Beach. The rationale was that many of the workers come from uh, Panama City and go to Panama City Beach. However, 
uh, our leaders on this side of the bridge uh, did not uh, put any uh, masks requirements in place uh, because they reasoned that, well, you know, the pandemic is primarily coming from the beach, so they're taking care of it out there. Uh, it's that kind of uh, a logic, flawed logic, uh, that is uh, putting many of our community members um, at risk. We've seen the numbers continue to go up, and now they're, they're dipping down. However, the numbers in our uh, schools are continuing, and unfortunately, we do have a three-year-old um, in Pensacola uh, fighting for her life with COVID pneumonia. She is already a sickle cell, um, uh, a person who has sickle cell anemia. Uh, today's report is a good one though. Uh, and, and we made the appeal to the school board yesterday and we will keep uh, doing that um, in an effort to get leadership to uh, take a more proactive role in following the CDC guidelines. So Janice, you, your, your efforts are uh, truly grounded and it, it sounds like you have some broad involvement in trying to serve your community. I'm just interested in, in how you have achieved that level of involvement that you've been able to be so responsive to uh, the challenges of your community. So the LEAD Coalition got its start in response to uh, seven homicides that occurred in nine weeks in Panama City, Florida. Small community in 2014, this really was uh, a, a astounding for us. And um, as we looked at the data, uh, we saw that had we been disaggregating the crime data, we could have seen this coming um, in these uh, targeted communities that became the areas that we're working in. So we use data. Following a, a Cat 5 hurricane, my, Hurricane Michael, uh, three years ago next month, October 10, that devastated our community, we refocused our efforts on uh, community development because it was, uh, we were hard pressed to focus on reducing violent crime in the wake of the devastation that occurred after having been hit by a Cat 5 storm. And so that uh, has brought us together with others uh, in looking at resilience. How do we come back better from a Cat 5 storm? And while we were trying to wrap our minds around that, here comes a, a worldwide pandemic. So we were already positioned to, to begin to look at what we needed to do as a community differently than uh, had we not been hit by a Cat 5 storm. And so you had already built some relationships of working relationships of trust that you're able to capitalize on. Yes. To an extent. yes. And so one of the things that the, the, the hurricane did for us was elevate the nonprofit status to that of uh, a service, not just a charity. Uh, they were in, a, in, in the mindset here for many years. It's been, oh, we want to do good. We want to help the charities. And after Hurricane Michael, every hand was on deck. We all had to work together. And so uh, that has changed, uh, has opened the doors, I think, for uh, better working relationships between government and nonprofits as partners in uh, community service and protection. Terrific. Now, I do want to say one thing, though. Uh, we do have an uphill battle when it comes to uh, those communities of color and, uh, and folk who historically have not had good relationships with the healthcare system. And so um, back in uh, the end of May, when we got our last um, reports in the county that uh, at the county level about race and, uh, and uh, ethnicity, numbers. Uh, we only had about 7% of the African American uh, population, which is our, our largest uh, minority, uh, that were vac vaccinated. We don't know what the numbers are now. We're working in the blind because those numbers are no longer given to us at the county level um, in that um, disaggregated uh, state. Uh, but we do know that as a result of the surge, then the numbers of people getting vaccinated uh, have increased, but we're still fighting an, an, an uphill battle. Misinformation, disinformation uh, is abounding. Well, I'd like to speak a little bit more to that and invite some participation from our full group in this too. Uh, you know, one of the pillars of our alliance is to focus on health equity. And today we're talking about the issue of building trust. And what are some of the critical things that we have to do from an equity standpoint in order 
to build trust. And I'd, I'd be interested in, in um, any examples that our members have um, at, at just responses to that question in terms of things that, that need to be done very prominently in the mix to, uh, to approach trust building from an equity standpoint. Janice, let me start with you in just terms of lessons learned. You're deep in this work. So one of the things that we were able to do um, last fall when we did a mission critical function survey uh, of those communities, going uh, door to door, going where people were already assembled, um, was we also utilized a existing trust networks. There are people who are already meeting together, who are already working together, who have uh, a wealth of knowledge and relationship and, and connecting with them with the information, we were able to get over 600 surveys completed in these hard to reach vulnerable communities. We, are ta we tapped into that network again in January when we offered our first vaccination event. And uh, we were able to vaccinate uh, more than 500 people. At that time, the, the target population was age 65 and older. And, um, and over uh, more than half, 300 uh, were African-Americans, our targeted, um, one of our targeted uh, um, groups here in, uh, in Panama City Bay County. And so the recognition that community organizations who are already working together, the churches, the uh, civic clubs, um, and, and two of our trust networks were, were dance companies. Uh, the dance company owners said that they wanted their parents to have access to this information. And, um, and we were able then to use uh, that existing network to get information about CARES Act funding and to take time to answer every question that, um, that parents had at the end of one of the dance company um, practice meetings where parents had come. So there are existing places where people are already meeting, connecting with them to talk about uh, getting vaccinated, the protocols and why, and then to have the patience, the respect and the patience to answer the questions as people have them because they're genuinely concerned. So tapping into existing trust networks. I, I see that, that uh, Lisa Simpson um, talked about uh, expanding the role of community health workers, uh, making sure that they're prominent um, in the mix because of their grounding um, in the communities and, pro and their understanding of, of trust networks. Steve, we have Mike McDonald who's got his hand raised. Ah, uh, Mike, yes, please. Hi, Steve um, and Kelly. Uh, I, I just wanna say some of the unique elements um, of what's happening in the panhandle of Florida uh, through Janice Lucas's work in Lead Coalition um, that just one attribute of that particular rack site is that it's a, it's a bottom-up community-centric effort. Uh, and it is reaching out and bridging to the community health centers and to public health uh, in a very difficult circumstance um, where uh, you, you have hierarchical uh, command and control systems that are broken way above the county level uh, which make it very difficult for them to act. So having a community uh, that has community-based organizations that actually are building the bridges, not waiting for the hierarchical control systems to act and, and reach out to them makes a huge difference in the trust in the community. Um, so if the community feels like it is their locus of control that are doing those bridges, uh, it, it immediately creates a different trust relationship. Now, that's difficult to do in some communities, but what we're finding is more and more communities around the country are resonating with that within the Resilient American Communities Unity of Effort. Yeah, thank you for, for that background. That, that's really helpful. Um, any, other, any other comments on, on trust building that um, any of you would like to, 
to make. We're, we're going to, to move to another component of the um, agenda in a moment, but um, anything else that, that we should be um, cognizant of? Yes, Lisa. Yes, you, you're, you're muted. Still. Yeah, I had too many windows open. I was trying to move them out of the way <laughs> if I could get to the unmute button. There's just too much going on here. My apologies. Uh, Lisa Simpson, Academy Health, great conversation. I just wanted to mention that we're going to be launching soon um, a, a, re, a for those who are interested in the, the research on how to build trust, because I think we all know how to break trust pretty easily, and we've uh, had bad experiences, uh, many of them uh, in the communities. And so we're launching a new research community to help build what we know about what works to build trust. And so uh, once that's launched, I'll, I'll be happy at the next call to, or whenever it's ready to, to share that. And we invite anybody who's interested uh, or can share it with their colleagues who help to evaluate uh, strategies to build trust. Um, that would be fantastic. So kind of a PSA announcement, but would love to get input. Your, your comment, it couldn't be better timed because um, I'm going to turn the, the meeting back to Angela um, because we're going to uh, talk about uh, some new initiatives that um, are happening within the Alliance that have to do with resources. And, and so, and Angie, also, I, Yeah, and Steve, I also saw Mary Pittman come off mute and just wanted to make sure oh, Mary, we sure. heard your voice for a brief moment and then we can make that pivot. Absolutely. Sure, just a, a, a real quick um, update. We have a, a network of uh, funders who have been supporting uh, PHI to work with community-based organizations throughout California. And the program name is Together Toward Health. And I, I just encourage people to take a look at some of the really innovative work that they've been doing um, in part, we serve as primarily the fiscal sponsor to get the dollars out to many very small community-based organizations who are trusted by their communities and who deep, do deep work similar to what Janice was describing. And um, in addition to that, what we realized is we could provide some support to help them be ready to receive additional funds in the future. So really mm -hmm. some um, building of some of their own systems that may have precluded them from being ready to receive funds in the past. And also to build those bridges between the local health departments and sometimes the healthcare systems with the CBOs to really start to make those connections um, sustainable for the new public health 3.0 that we're all talking about. I won't say anything more, but I just urge you to take a look on the PHI website to uh, get more information on Together Toward Health. That will be uh, excellent to do. That is, is addressing one of the critical challenges that um, is related to equity in terms of participation in public health, the ability to receive dollars um, at the at CBO level. Okay, terrific. So Angie, why don't we come back to you? Sure, thanks. And I would just say, um, I think we have taken from this, that this is certainly something we're going to be discussing over the months to come. And so um, from all of you, as you have new resources, I was excited to see um, Lisa also shared buildingtrust.org, which um, we'll share with others, which looks like exactly in line with what we're talking about, um, that idea of how do we really support those on the ground now, um, but also then make sure we're supporting them long run. So we do get to, you know, the workforce that we need to move this ahead to the resources we need. Um, and to making sure that we're really figuring out how we bring in communities and have that um, voice of equity like we've talked about. Um, but I'm not going to totally make a shift. And so I want to have an exciting uh, update for you all. And then we can go back to this discussion, but just wanted to have a chance to tell you all about two projects underway as part of um, the Alliance. We heard that we had heard from you all would be valuable um, to help with connecting and uh, moving things ahead in the field. Um, we're fortunate that we now are working with a partner, the Institute for People, Place, and Possibility. I believe Aaron and Sarah may be on the call with us, um, but they have expertise. I'm just like, let me share my screen so that you all can actually see what I am looking at. Okay, hopefully you can see it. 
Um, let me get it on slideshow. So um, we have been working with IP3, who is a not-for-profit, um, really working to create healthy, equitable, sustainable communities, advancing well-being. Um, they've worked on a project that many of you all may know, Community Commons. Um, they really work at transformative change um, through movement. They've done a lot with resources, with connecting efforts. Um, so we're really excited that two of the things we had heard that we thought would be helpful one is having a go-to place that can virtually connect all of these amazing resources that we've heard of. Um, I think today we could think about what it is around building trust that maybe needs to be built up, um, that we could help somebody to come saying, I wanna know about how to build trust in communities, go to some sort of resources. I wanna know how to support professionals and go somewhere else so that um, we really hope to be able to um, help change makers and all of you all practitioners, the public, be able to navigate all those amazing resources out there. Um, like we've said with our work at the Alliance in general, the last thing we want to do is duplicate anything. We really want to help to find, help people to be able to get to all of these amazing resources and to really find curated good public health scientific resources um, and find the ones that they need. So we know how busy everybody is. Um, they don't have the time to do some of this Googling search <laughs> that we do. I know even thinking about this a lot of my time each day, I'm always excited to hear about new things like buildingtrust.org. Um, so we really hope this is something that together we can figure out how to put materials together. And so IP3 is going to help us to develop a virtual navigator to really lift up a wide range of resources. Um, you all have these slides, but we want everything from articles to data to communications materials, toolkits. You can see a presentation that people could take and tweak um, for their own purposes. Um, and we really wanna be able to highlight those great resources out there. So how can we help someone get to not just CDC resources, but some of those from communities, from all of your groups, so that we're really um, pulling together all this amazing wisdom that we have into one place. Um, we expect to rely on the groups developing the materials to keep them. The last thing we want to do is house all of this. We really want to be able to help people find it. And so that's a challenge that we're going to start um, figuring out how to develop. Um, as part of that, we may ask all of you all for help. Um, there's a short questionnaire that we'll send out in the next couple days. I'm trying to think about which topics do we want to start curating materials on. Um, we're aware that there's a lot we need to do. And so just thought we'd pick out a few to really dive into more deeply now. Um, but just to start doing it, we'd also love to hear from you all if there are big resources or hubs that we need to make sure we're highlighting. Um, we may not be able to get all of the resources at once. But if we can at least point to something like CDC's resource as an X topic or vaccine equities hub, um, that'll be a way that we hope people can get there. And later we can figure out how to build it and expand it as needed. Um, we also may do some user inter or conversations with you all, so may call on some of you all to have a discussion about what you think would be most useful, how we can make this the most relevant tool for everyone, how to figure out how to get resources and keep them up to date. Um, and then once we launch this, we will ask all of you all if possible to help us find the right resources. And so to let us know about those that you think are most relevant as you develop new ones um, to help us figure out how to keep this up to date. Because um, I think that will be the challenge is the more we can help to amplify and share information, um, we hope to make this as useful as possible for all of us. The second part is that we really just heard that knowing who's in the field, who's working in COVID right now, um, but going forward, who are out there and working on equity, how can we bring people into our public health discussion would be really valuable. Um, so we also are working on, oops, sorry, went too fast. Um, figure out how to map and categorize the work organizations and individuals involved in COVID around the field or in the country. So we want to figure out how we can help to facilitate collaboration among both the existing partners, those of you on the call, as well as some of those that we really haven't had a chance to interact with. How can we help to find and identify um, people who really can help us to bring this multi-sector, multidisciplinary perspective? And how can we really make sure that we're calling on new and different voices? And so that's something that we're excited to figure out how to explore. Um, we hope that this will help us to share lessons and innovations with different partners from different sectors. You can see here public health, healthcare, and community. Um, and we really want to work to, we hope this will help with strategy, with cohesion and civic engagement so that we can find new partners. If they're interested in doing something really excited like Janice was doing in the Bay Area, we hope this would help people to be able to find those partners that they need and to find resources and lessons that can help them. Um, so with this also, as I mentioned, we're starting with COVID, but we will um, try to extend it quickly as we get there. And also 
for some of the same partners, we know you do a lot more than COVID in normal times. So we'd love to also gradually kind of expand what information we have about different partners. Um, for this, the same thing, we may ask for you all to help us with discovering and designing it, um, ideas on how to make this useful. If there's something out there that's already good that we should build off of or model things off of, that would be great. Um, I know Community Commons and IP3s had work on developing some and had internally been thinking about how to do this otherwise, but um, we hope this will be more of a long-term effort. So we'll start with COVID and we may put out something originally that's a little bit more, I think I keep saying quick and dirty, but something that'll just help us connect. But we hope over time to get this to be a really useful long-term process um, that hopefully can be helpful for all of us and we can gradually add in new partners and colleagues as needed um, to help us meet our goal. Um, IP3 was kind enough to also provide um, a link to their website. You have these slides. Um, we'll keep updating you on this over time. We hope to have some initial things um, from these interviews to share with you all in the next couple months. Um, but we're excited to get this started. Um, maybe calling on you all if anybody wants to volunteer to be part of our focus groups or um, have resources that you really want to make sure we're connecting with, that would be great. Um, and this is just really to keep you all posted and we're looking forward to coming back to you soon once we have um, some models to start with. Any questions for us quickly? Angie, Mary Pittman has asked a question in the chat about if yeah. there's a plan to bring people together at APHE, APHA live and or virtually. Yes, that is a great question. Um, sorry, I'm going to try to stop sharing so we can see everybody again. Um, we are, we have a couple sessions um, at APHA, but I think we certainly could try to find time. If for those of you in Denver, it would be great to see people live and in person. Um, I'm happy to help figure out a place where we could meet that may be outside so that we can freely interact and chat. But um, if people are going, that would be great. And I think um, for the virtual audience, maybe we can think about how to host maybe a virtual discussion too. Um, one thing we will have that has also kind of come out of our Alliance work, um, there's a featured session that will take place on Monday morning that's really talking about the challenges to public health authority. Um, we're excited we're going to have a session with Don Eleven, I see on the screen, um, but also um, Umar Shah, from the Secretary from Washington State, and also former um, Paris County Health Commissioner will talk about some of the work he's been thinking about. Um, Eduardo Sanchez, who is Chief Medical Officer at the American Heart Association, who's really been involved in helping think through advocacy around preemption and now extending it to legal authority. Um, and then finally, Joe Mazzola, who's at Franklin County Health in Ohio. He's the commissioner and they've really dealt recently with a lot of the really um, challenging laws that have really um, restricted their freedom and so their ability to act, sorry, freedom would be wrong. Um, and so we hope that we'll get people talking about this. Um, there will also be a session that you're all welcome to come to. We would love to have on Tuesday afternoon um, where we wanted to let anybody at the conference interested in finding out more about this issue, what they can do to have a chance to come together um, think about resources and how to connect. So those are a couple of opportunities. Um, we also will have an Alliance session virtually on Sunday, which um, I will tell you more about over email soon. I'm still coming together, but we have a couple opportunities there. But Mary, I think um, we can certainly think about where we can meet up. So if those of you um, know you'll be in Denver, please let me know and I'll try to figure out how we can connect. For those of you joining us virtually also, um, we can do the same thing. And Mary, if you have a suggestion for where or when we should meet, let me know. Thanks, Angie. Sure. Just picking up on um, something that Angie was just talking about, which is the survey for IP3. Um, one of the things I've been impressed by um, is that, that IP3 is really guided by the principle that this is about uh, providing resources to, to support action. And so we really need to have your input um, on what you need uh, in order to support action and what those that you work with need. So we just encourage you um, uh, when the survey is, is, is out to, uh, to respond and help in essentially co-designing with this, this uh, program. Great. So we're, we're Heading towards the end of our time, but uh, I'd like to uh, take the last few minutes um, to just provide an opportunity for anybody on the call uh, to share uh, information with us on um, any initiative you think the Alliance uh, needs to know about that's important and that, that may uh, uh, potentially benefit from 
uh, from co collaboration. Anybody who'd like to weigh in. I, I see Aurora's hand. Yes. Yes, hi, thank you. I just wanted to give a plug for the Vaccine Equity Cooperative. It's something that Noctua Health uh, co-found. It's part of a larger uh, health equity movement. Uh, our website repository is now live at vaccineequitycooperative.org. There you can find a lot of community specific resources, toolkits, uh, webinars and the like. Um, which you can search and sort of download all for free. We're working on a bright spotting series. Um, and they're also always looking for opportunities to collaborate with others. So if anyone's interested in learning more about the Vaccine Equity Cooperative or wants to be connected, um, I'll put my email in the chat as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any other updates? Um, Steve, I'd, I'd like to ask a question. Um, I, I would love to hear from members of the Alliance where they <clears throat> have been able to uh, identify outbreaks very early and actually begin to uh, stop them. Um, I mean, there's so many cases of just how we've gone from an index case in a specific community that wasn't really identified and then there's just a wash of cases that were completely out of control. That's happened all over the country for now a year and a half. What would be interesting is to see if we could document cases where we actually had the ability to pick up on wastewater um, uh, testing of, of uh, a COVID case that emerges um, or uh, school uh, cases of uh, COVID in schools where they were able to actually uh, appropriately isolate and, and, um, and be able to quarantine and then go on to have somewhat normal um, uh, operations within uh, either a workplace or a school or whatever. Uh, I, don't, I have not seen the evidence of that um, and how it could be replicated, but I'm, my, our interest is being able to have upstream hyperlocal uh, actions that could be taken more in a rapid response, almost like uh, special forces. And, and we just have not um, seen the evidence that, that we can do that systematically. Uh, and it seems like that's gonna be a crucial element of this, especially when we can get the cases down far enough with extensive vaccination and, and masking and so on where uh, we actually have numbers that are, are manageable in specific locations. So I'm just wondering if anybody has any evidence that um, those kinds of actions have taken place and uh, the communities have remained uh, with no cases or very low cases for longer periods of time. And that's obviously happening in other countries, but I don't see it in the United States. Would anyone like to comment on that, that anticipatory approach? I, I just think we should point to other, some other countries where it is happening too, that should be part of the study. So I, I'd like to encourage us to actually move on that uh, and, and have a, a, a meta analysis of where that is happening. Uh, successfully and unsuccessfully. Hmm. Mary um, Pittman has added an, a comment as well in the chat about a number, knowing about a number of communities doing this, but all grant funded. Um, water testing programs need to be part of the infrastructure, not a grant project. Um, and C. Davis, California, where testing happens and my team know of other places. Um, so thank you, Mary. Anything else you'd want to say about that, please jump in. No, I, I, my depth of knowledge is relatively thin. I know that I have some um, staff working in environmental health tracking who are following this. And, and it, as Michael said, it's a good way to 
anticipate a, a cluster before you see it or a surge, um, but it, it's not being implemented broadly. And it tends to need a, a sizable population. So it's predominantly being done in urban areas. Hmm. Thank you very much. You know, th this is Janet Hamilton from CST. And I would just say, I mean, I think it's really hard. We have a very highly infectious virus and the, sy the system between the time someone is tested till the time results are within public health, you know, essentially individuals have already infected people um, and lots of people because of the very uh, short incubation period and the fact that even symptomatic individuals are transmissible 48 hours before, you know, they are exhibiting symptoms. So I think that's where our members really feel like the push forward um, in terms of control measures, masking and, and vaccines is really the conversation. By the time we're identifying uh, cases, you know, they're already infectious and infecting others. And so it's, it's just in, incredibly hard. And I think the family dynamics within transmission as well is, is also really driving um, a lot of the case rates that we're seeing, as well as of course, schools open now. All right, we're close to our time. Any final comments? I'll just give one shameless plug and that's that um, the newsletter, if you all have ideas and things that you wanna share with folks, um, please send that to us and we'll make sure that we include it. If there's something really immediate, happy to send out more regular emails too. I just know we have so many things going that we're trying to keep it at a little bit more of a regular interval, but I'm always happy to share things amongst each other. All right. I think that wraps up our, our time together today. Gives you an extra five minutes in the day. Thank you for coming. Thanks all, have a great month and we'll be in touch soon. Bye everybody. Thank you, Kay. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kay. Thank you, Janice. Appreciate your time. So thank you. Up. Thank you all for doing this. Yes. It was so great to have you. Thank you. Yeah. And that was really impressive to hear about. Very helpful to everybody. And Mike, thanks for weighing in. Appreciated your remarks. Well, it's great to see this going in this direction. Um, and I think there's a lot that we can do relatively quickly um, if we are able to uh, get the resources going in the right direction to be more bottom up and community centric, especially if we can get it uh, in more of an anticipatory um, system. All right, All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And this um, Ernest uh, Grant had mentioned really appreciated the format and would really love to do this about every other meeting or so. So maybe it's that, you know, centering that community voice, having a, a chance to share, you know, resources with one another and have a little exchange like that. And the chat was just lit up. So there's a lot of, of things that we can capture from that. Angie, are you planning to copy that chat? I just saved the chat, yes. You just saved it, okay, good. And I'm gonna stop. Um, recording because we don't really need to see ourselves chat. <laughs>